Okay, so welcome back to this video in which we are uh, trying to work out what uh, gamma of a half is. Uh, so we said just by definition that uh, gamma of half was going to be equal to the integral from 0 to infinity e to the negative t over the square root of t. We then performed integration by substitution and got that this was actually equal to the square root of t times the integral from 0 to infinity e to the negative u squared over 2. So we are now trying to work out the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative u squared over 2. So uh, what we uh, noted is that this is the same problem as uh, we faced earlier on when we were discussing the, uh, uh, the um, standard normal distribution PDF. Uh, and what we did here, there, and what we're doing here as well, is we rotate, we consider rotating it around and forming, forming the surface of revolution. And instead of finding the area under the curve, find the volume under that surface of revolution. And I've shown you by, uh, shown you that um, uh, by the argument of surface of revolution, uh, that's going to be equal to the integral from 0 to infinity e to the negative x squared over 2 times 2 pi x dx. Okay, so let's perform that integral now, which is quite an easy integral to perform, because basically we just invert the chain rule. So by the fundamental theorem of calculus, second fundamental theorem of calculus, we need an antiderivative of this, but... Uh, basically, if we consider the inter if we consider the function e to the negative x squared dx, and if we differentiate that, what do we get? We're going to get well. If we differentiate the exponential, we just get e to the negative x squared over two. The chain rule says we have to differentiate the inside thing. If we differentiate that, we're going to get times negative x. So you bring the power down. That cancels with the two there, and just get negative x. Okay. So you get negative x e to the negative x squared over two. Okay. Right. Uh, so um, that's looking awfully like that thing in, that we've got in there. So just one little tweak, basically. It, we've got that 2 pi there, uh, which we could just pull out, you know. But uh, just because we can do it, um, let's just make the tweak and say, OK, d dx of negative 2 pi e to the negative x squared over 2. What's that going to be equal to? Well, it's going to be equal to negative 2 pi. Uh, differentiate the e to the negative x squared, you get e to the negative x squared over 2. Uh, differentiate the negative x squared over 2, you get negative x again. And this becomes 2 pi x e to the negative x squared over 2, just cancelling the two negatives and moving a few things around, which is exactly our integrand. Therefore, this thing here is the antiderivative of our integrand. So by the second fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, we can then just say that the integral from 0 to infinity of uh, e to the negative x squared over 2 times 2 pi x dx is going to be this thing here evaluated between uh, 0 and infinity. Now if you evaluate this at infinity uh, it's going to, well, take the limit as it approaches infinity. As you approach infinity, uh, at, well, let me just write it out. The limit as x approaches infinity, let's say, of negative 2 pi e to the negative x squared over 2 and then, we, of course, we've got minus the thing evaluated at 0, which is negative 2 pi e to the negative 0 squared over 2. So that there we've just applied the fundamental theorem of calculus to get from that to that. OK, right. This limit, as x approaches infinity, this is a bell-shaped curve. This goes off to 0, basically. Uh, and... Uh, yes, because this just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And when you take the exponent of a ne the negative exponent of a bigger and bigger number, it's going to go to zero. And let me just move this up a bit. All right, we don't need that anymore. Okay, uh, so this limit is just equal to zero. So uh, this becomes the important thing here. Now, if you evaluate this at here, you get zero. So you evaluate the exponent at zero, the exponential function at zero, and the exponential function evaluated at zero is just one. So we get one here. This thing here is one. And then it's 1 times negative 2 pi, but the negative of that, so we just get 2 pi. So we find, basically, uh, that the area under this uh, molehill, which I'll redraw, uh, the area under this molehill, so here is, let me draw, so here is our original bell-shaped curve, not brilliantly drawn. So this is the function e to the negative x squared over 2, and then we rotate that around to get a molehill-like thing. In the pl uh, well, in 3D, like that, and uh, the area under that is going to be equal to 2 pi. But basically, there's another way of uh, doing finding the area underneath this. 
uh, because uh, the, sorry, the volume underneath this, we can perform, we can view this as being a function of two variables. Now, what is it going to be as a function of two variables? Well, it's uh, symmetric, it's radially symmetric, so what any point, so what any point, uh, let's say little x, little y, is going to be mapped onto is just dependent on its radial value. And basically, you just need to find the radial value of this, and you need to plug it into here. So you need to work out what the distance distance of any point is from this origin over here, which is 0, 0, and basically find that radial distance and then plug it into here because uh, whatever your radial distance is, whatever your radial distance is here, your value, your height, your z value is going to be the same as the z value of that radial distance from the origin where you just go along the x-axis. So it's going to be the same as whatever uh, e to the negative r squared is over 2 is because of the fact that we got this by uh, rotating this around in this surface of revolution way. So all the points that are the same radius from the origin are basically going to have the same value. So you can work out the height of any point x, what little x, little y in the plane by working out its radial value and plugging it into this formula, basically. Now, what is the radial value or a radial distance uh, of, away from the origin of a point little x, little y? Well, just by Pythagoras' theorem, it's the square root of x squared plus y squared, because that's just a right angled triangle like right there. There's your x, there's your y, you want this side. There, that's Pythagoras' theorem. That r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. Uh, now we want to plug in r squared rather than r, so that makes it even nicer because this function, this function is of two variables now, becomes e to the negative x squared plus y squared over 2. So basically this molehill viewed as a function of uh, r2 is given by this, okay? Uh, so if you want to view it in multivariable calculus sense rather than as a surface of, in the surface of revolution sense, uh, this is how uh, you would describe this as a um, as a multivariable calculus problem. So if you want to work out the uh, volume underneath that surface, what we just do is take the double integral uh, over the entire plane. Uh, dx dy basically so we now just need to put in the appropriate limits so we need to go from negative infinity to infinity and from negative infinity to infinity because we want to integrate over the entire plane basically okay right uh, so uh, this um, this basically can be split up because this can, this can be split up into iterated integrals so it can be thought of as the integral from negative infinity to infinity of the integral from negative infinity to infinity of, and now we can split up this function, we can split it into e to the negative x squared over 2 times e to the negative y squared over 2 uh, dx dy. Now, uh, and maybe we should put the dy outside the dx like that, so we have this bracket because we're taking the integral of this integral with respect to x. Now, as far as this integral with respect to x is concerned, this bit here, this e to the negative y squared over 2, is just a constant. So that can be pulled out. So we can pull that out of this integral and put it over here. So then we perform this. Uh, so, well, actually, uh, let me just write that out because otherwise we won't be able to see this. So we put this thing here, e to the negative y squared over 2, and then we get this integral from negative infinity to infinity e to the negative x squared over 2 dx, and then we're integrating that with respect to y. Okay, now what is this integral here? The integral from negative infinity to infinity e to the negative x squared over 2. Well, that's our original function. Remember, our original function was... Uh, was e to the negative x squared over 2. Yes, okay, we were only in wanted the integral from 0 to infinity, but we can certainly extend the function onto the other side, and in fact it's an even function, it's symmetrical in the y-axis because this x squared turns all these negative numbers, so if you take negative 2, that goes to the same thing as 2 because negative 2 squared is the same as 2. So every uh, number goes to the same as its, po every negative number goes to the same as its positive correspondent num corresponding number. Okay, uh, so um, this integral, e to the negative x squared over 2, is in fact, uh, between negative infinity and infinity, is just some constant. It just means the area underneath this curve. It is a constant. It is not dependent on y is the important thing. So I can pull that integral out, basically. Uh, so I'll pull it out, the integral from negative infinity 
to infinity e to the negative x squared over 2 dx. So that's a constant, and it's times by this integral from negative infinity to infinity e to the negative y squared over 2 dy. But then this is exactly the same integral. This is again just a constant. So whatever this constant is, it's now this same constant squared. So we could just write this as the integral from negative infinity to infinity e to the negative x squared over 2 dx squared, like so, basically. Whatever that constant is, square it. Now, we weren't after the integral from negative infinity to infinity e to the negative x squared over 2 dx. We wanted the integral from 0 to infinity e to the negative x squared over 2 dx. Uh, because that was the function, basically, uh, when, we, uh, when we took our gamma of a half, the function we reduced that to is the square root of 2 times that integral there. So, uh, however, uh, but the thing is, because it's completely symmetric around the y-axis, this is in fact just equal to a half times that integral there from negative infinity to infinity e to the negative x squared over 2. So basically, these integrals in here are just 2 times that. So we'll replace it with that. So we get basically 2 times the integral from negative infinity to infinity e to the negative x squared over 2 dx squared is equal to that... Sorry, oh dear, what have I done? From 0 to infinity. So basically, we just wanted to replace this integral here with the integral we actually wanted, okay? Now, that is equal to the volume underneath this molehill here, okay? And we worked out, using our surface of revolution argument, what the volume underneath that uh, that molehill is. So this is going to be equal to 2 pi, basically. And then if we take the square root of both sides, uh, this reduces to the fact that um, 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x squared over 2 dx is equal to the square root of 2 pi. Now we just divide both sides by 2, so we get the square root of 2 pi over 2. Okay, right, we'll leave it as that for now. And now we just substitute it back into our original formula over here. So we found that this integral is equal to the square root of 2 pi over 2. Multiply that by the square root of 2, pi, two to get uh, gamma of a half. So we get that gamma of a half is equal to the square root of 2 cancels with this square root of 2 here to give you 2 times the square root of pi over 2. The 2's cancel, and you get that gamma of a half is equal to the square root of pi. And that is a very famous result, a very beautiful result, that uh, this, in some sense, extension of the factorial function evaluated at the equivalent of minus half, if you uh, remember that the gamma function is the... Um, is the um, factorial function shifted by 1. So in some sense, this is almost like the extension of minus a half. This is what minus a half would be uh, if, the, if it wasn't shifted. It would be minus a half if the gamma function hadn't been shifted 1 to the right uh, of the factorial function. Of course, it is gamma of a half rather than gamma of a minus a half, but in some sense, it's minus a half factorial. But don't say that it's not minus half factorial. The factorial function is only defined on the non-negative integers. Uh, gamma is a different function, it, but it extends the factorial function. Okay, so now let's use that uh, just to extend it to uh, all the other points that we can do. Uh, so gamma of a half, what we found, is equal to the square root of pi. So I argued at, uh, earlier that we had this identity that gamma of k plus 1 is equal to k times gamma of k. And now that works uh, for whatever value of k you pick that is greater than zero, so where the factorial function is, de uh, is defined. So, we have worked out what gamma of a half is equal to, and that basically means that we can now get what gamma of 3 over 2 is, what gamma of 5 over 2 is, and, well, from what gamma of 3 over 2 is, we can get what gamma of 5 over 2 is, and more generally, we can get all of the halves, basically. So, let me show you how to do that. So, firstly, uh, if we want... Uh, if we want we know that gamma of a half is equal to the square root of pi. If we want gamma of 3 over 2, then that's equal to gamma of a half plus 1. So that, by this identity here, is equal to a half, because k is taking the place, half is taking the place of k, times gamma of a half. So we get that this is equal to a half times the square root of pi. Next up, we have gamma of 5 over 2, 
which is equal to uh, gamma of 3 over 2 plus 1 etc. So now uh, we say that uh, 3 over 2 is taking the place of k so we're going to get 3 over 2 times gamma of 3 over 2 which is equal to 3 over 2 and substitute in what gamma of 3 over 2 is equal to it's going to be a half times the square root of pi. Okay so what you can see is going to happen if we go up if you want gamma of 5 over 2, what we're going to get is that that is equal to 5 over 2 times gamma of 3 over 2. So each time you go up, you're going to multiply it by 5 over 2. So we can see that if you want gamma of, um, let's say, uh, it needs to obviously be an odd number up here. So let's say uh, m over over 2, let's say, where m is an odd number. So it's equal to 1, 3, 5, 7, etc. So m is equal to some odd number. 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, etc. Uh, then it's going to have, we can see that the 2's are going to gather up in the denominator. So you're going to get the number of 2's that you have had to get uh, to get there. So uh, f uh, when, you, um, when you take when you have m in this way, you need to count the number of 2's. So for 3, there was going to be 2 2's in the denominator. For 5, there was going to be 3 2's. So it's how many you are along here. So basically, what you need to do is you need to add 1 to it and divide it by 2. Okay? m plus 1 over 2. So just make sure that you are comfortable with why that works. Uh, well, that it works, really. So if you put in m is equal to 1, it's going to give you 2 over 2, which is just 1. So you're going to get a half there. So we'll just put the square root of pi to make it um, look better. Uh, so that's going to give us the correct answer here. If we put in uh, 3, then this is going to give us 4 at the top. Divide it by 2, you're going to get 2. So basically, this is going to map you onto your position uh, in the odd numbers, basically. So 1 is the first odd number. 3 is going to be mapped onto the second one. 5 is going to be mapped onto 3, etc. Okay, uh, so uh, that gets the denominator right. It doesn't get the numerator right. We still need the fact that you're going to have, for this one, you're going to have 5 times 3 times 1 over 2 to the power of 3, the square root of pi. And hopefully you should be able to see what's happening here. We are uh, taking the odd numbers factorial. We're missing out the even numbers. We, it's effectively the factorial function. Take out... Uh, remove the even numbers basically um, okay uh, and that is basically what gamma of m over 2 is going to be equal to so it's going to need in this numerator here you're going to need the odd numbers factorial so not m factorial but the odd numbers m multiplied by um, m minus 2 multiplied by m minus 4 etc all the way down to 1 basically you're going to get all the odd numbers, all so if you had nine, it would be nine times seven times five times three times one. So whichever number here you multiply it by all of the preceding odd numbers, basically, that is what gamma of m over two is going to be equal to.